Hi, welcome to the Yale University Art Gallery. My name is Lisa Brody. I'm the Associate Curator of Ancient Art. I'm standing in our sculpture hall, which is our gallery for art of the ancient Mediterranean. Our collection ranges from ancient Near Eastern art to art of the Byzantine Empire. It includes Etruscan, Greek, Roman, um, some of our highlights include reliefs from the palace at Nimrud, a lion from the Ishtar Gate at Babylon. We have an extremely strong collection of Attic black and red figure vases, as well as ancient glass. What I would like to introduce you to today are our archaeological collections, materials excavated by Yale University as collaborative projects in the 1920s and 1930s at the sites of Gerasa and Dariopus. From 1928 to 1934, Yale University participated in excavations together with the British School of Archaeology in Jerusalem and the American Schools of Oriental Research at ancient Gerasa in what is today Jordan. As a result, the art gallery holds a substantial collection of artifacts, primarily lamps and pottery, uh, as well as the excavation archives from those seasons. Among the most spectacular works of art that came to the gallery from Gerasa is the mosaic on the wall behind me. This mosaic was excavated in the Church of Saints Peter and Paul, which um, is dated to approximately 540. And it was the floor of the nave. It was a triple aisled church, as most Byzantine churches in Garasa and of the time were. It was relatively plain on the exterior with elaborate architectural and decorative elements on the inside, including um, elaborately carved columns and moldings and mosaic floors. This mosaic represents about 15 to 20 percent of the original mosaic nave floor of the church. It is a type known as a city mosaic, quite common in Byzantine Jordan. There are other examples known from Gerasa itself, the Church of St. John the Baptist has a similar themed mosaic. The most elaborate example known is from the site of Madaba, called the Madaba map. Our mosaic represents the cities of Alexandria and Memphis. Above them is an inscription in Greek in a tabula ansata format, which gives us the name of the church's donor. Bishop Anastasius and tells us that it was dedicated to Peter and Paul. Above that, an amphora with grapevines sort of lushly exuding from the mouth of the vase. The tesserae of this mosaic are all limestone of various colors and shades, all of which would have been quarried locally around the region of Garasa. In the amphora, are a series of tesserae that look different, that are a sort of uh, gray, white, veined stone, which we think is marble rather than limestone, and was deliberately chosen to give the vessel a luxurious appearance, giving the effect of a silver vase. So the cities are both represented with, I would say, schematic and yet specific architectural details that don't necessarily reflect those individual cities, but they clearly read as city to a viewer. So there is a city wall going around each of them with defensive fortifications, towers um, at intervals around the wall, domes and rotundas, towers within the city, and then interesting details such as this, which are intended to represent a colonnaded street, which were typical of cities in the uh, ancient Mediterranean at the time. The inscription at the top clearly identifies it as the specific city meant to be represented. Um, they are both surrounded by 
very lush foliage, these trees laden with fruits, oranges, probably quinces, pomegranates in some cases. The mosaic was excavated and as was pretty standard practice at the time, cut into sections. This uh, fragment that survives was cut into six different pieces, each of which was backed in concrete and reinforced with an iron um, sort of grid on the back of each piece. It was brought to New Haven and installed on this very wall in the 1930s. We believe it hung on the wall for only about 10 years and then was taken down due to um, visible cracks and conservation issues that were beginning to appear, it was put into storage where it remained until 2009 when we decided to pull it out and treat it and prepare it for installation at the time the art gallery was undergoing renovations and preparing for a major reopening of the entire gallery. Um, consultation between curators and conservators and other members of our staff resulted in a very innovative and exciting conservation treatment of this piece, which involved using a CNC machine, computer numeric controlled grinding machine, to actually mill the concrete off of the back of each fragment. So the pieces were laid face down on a bed, um, and then a, a specially outfitted drill bit was used to mill off the concrete and because of the precision of programming the computer, it could be done so that the concrete was removed to within millimeters of the back of the ancient tesserae. And then for each section, custom composite panels were created, which um, I liken to a surfboard. So they're made of fiberglass and high density foam and um, epoxy put on the back of each fragment with the result that each piece would in the end weigh only a fraction of what it had with the concrete on making it easier to transport, to store, um, and to install the pieces. The floor mosaic remained in the six fragments that were created when it was excavated. We used the excavation photographs as part of our treatment plan. So any sections where the tesserae were actually missing upon discovery, we did not try to restore the pattern. We left them as missing sections, um, even in areas where the sort of geometric um, design would have allowed for restoration or reconstruction. Other areas that were lost by the cutting of the piece upon excavation, but where we could see what it looked like upon discovery from the excavation photographs, we did actually restore. So there's a section right here, which is the line between pieces, was actually restored by our conservation team using foam that was carved to look like tesserae and then painted. So from a distance, it isn't even obvious that there's restoration that's been done, but if you get up close, um, and certainly it's a reversible treatment that is clearly obvious to somebody who is looking for it. On the back of the panels are a custom-made aluminum hanging frame or, or hardware piece that could then be mounted into the grout lines of this stone wall or um, into another wall that it would be installed on. After conservation was completed on this piece, it actually traveled to the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, where it was installed as um, sort of the show-stopping first object you saw as you entered the exhibition from Byzantium to Islam. After that show closed, it came back here and was installed in our galleries in time for our reopening of the museum in 2012.
Around the same time that Yale was excavating at Garasa, the university was also involved in excavations at the site of Dura Europis in what is today Syria. The project was a collaboration with the French Academy of Inscriptions and Letters. It lasted for 10 years, from 1928 to 1937. And as a result, the art gallery holds a collection of approximately 12,000 works of art and artifacts from the site, as well as the excavation archives from the entire excavation period. There are also parchments and papyri that are preserved in the Beinecke Yale's Rare Book and Manuscript Library. After the objects excavated from Dura were brought back to New Haven, many of them were installed in the art gallery, um, but at the time they were shown in the context of the Roman Empire together with the rest of our collection of ancient Greek and Roman art. In 2012, the museum underwent a major renovation and expansion, and at that point, this gallery space was dedicated to the art of ancient Dura Europas, and it gave us the opportunity to showcase the objects from the city in a way that could really give visitors a sense of what the city had to offer and what life was like in this part of the ancient world. Dura Europas was founded around 300 BC by Macedonian Greek soldiers. Located on the banks of the Euphrates River, just as today this is a region that is extremely contested, so it was in antiquity. So around 113 BC, the area and the city of Dura came under the control of the Parthian Empire. Um, at that point, it was one of the cities on the empire's western edge, and it actually remained under Parthian control for the longest period of time of its history, almost three centuries. But archaeologically, we actually have very little that we can identify as strictly belonging to the Parthian era. Most of what we have in, within the material culture of the excavations comes from the last phase of the city's history. It was conquered and occupied by the Romans around AD 165 and became a military garrison at that point, a frontier city on the empire's eastern edge, so it was always on the edges of all of these different empires. In the middle of the third century, in the 250s, the city was besieged by the Sasanians, another eastern empire, eastern force that was fighting against the Romans at that time. Dura had always been quite well geographically protected uh, with the Euphrates River on its eastern edge, deep ravines on the north and south. So it was the western side of the city that was most vulnerable to attack. And so a major fortification wall was built along that edge. The main city gate is on the western side. This gate was known as the Palmyrene Gate to the excavators because the road from there led straight west to Palmyra. As part of the city's defenses, when the siege was taking place, the inhabitants of Dura constructed a huge earthen embankment along the interior of the city wall. And in addition to the spectacular archeological preservation that we see from the entire city being situated in the Syrian desert, this embankment created a microclimate so that we get from that region, that area of the city, um, particularly good preservation of organic materials, including wall paintings and leather um, and wood. And along that wall, the buildings that were preserved by the embankment include the synagogue, the house church, and the Mithraeum. 
As a result of the many different forces involved in controlling Dura Europis and its location on the edge of the Roman Empire, Dura was an extremely multicultural city in antiquity. Um, I think what's important to recognize is that the extraordinary preservation of the archaeological remains shows us this multiculturalism in a way that seems extraordinary and visitors are often taken aback by the wall paintings and papyri and parchment and leather and bone and wood that survives from the site. Um, I would say that yes, the preservation makes Dura extraordinary and what it tells us about the ancient Roman world is extraordinary, but there is nothing about the city of Dura Europis in antiquity that was extraordinary. It was a small military garrison on the edge of the empire. There is nothing unique about it. What it in fact tells us is that this kind of multiculturalism was probably quite typical of the ancient world, which is fascinating and, and important in its own right. That multiculturalism is really epitomized um, in the archaeological record as a whole, but in this particular wall painting in, it, in and of itself. This is a wall painting from the Temple of the Palmyrene Gods, and it shows a Roman tribune, Julius Terentius, making a sacrifice. You see the incense burner to his side. Uh, his, his troops, his cohort, stand behind him with the sta Roman standard being held right in front. He's making a sacrifice um, to the deities shown in the upper left. We know they are deities, um, not only because of the nimbus around their heads, but they stand on bases. They are statues of divinities. They are not identified by inscription, but the context of the painting suggests that they are the sort of Palmyrene gods um, of preeminence worshipped in this region. Julius Terentius is fighting for the Romans. His name is in Latin. His troops are part of the Roman army. Watching the scene, if you can imagine that, from the lower left are these two female figures. They were identified by inscriptions, although the inscriptions are no longer very visible to the naked eye. Um, the one on the left is the Gad or city goddess of Dura. The one on the right, the city goddess of Palmyra. They wear distinctive headdresses in the form of a city wall, telling us that they are the personification of a city. They are, their divinity is shown by the nimbus around their heads. And the distinctive pyramidal seated form that they are shown in is that of the Hellenistic Greek, uh, very famous statue, the Tyche of Antioch, which from its creation in the Hellenistic period informed images of city goddesses for centuries. So this one wall painting includes elements of Rome, the Roman military, which was such an important part of Dura Europis's identity in the third century, Palmyra, and a very strong Hellenic, Hellenistic Greek tradition. So one of the most striking elements of Dura's multiculturalism is the variety of religious communities that coexisted at the site in, say, the second quarter of the third century, at least. Um, we have, from the archaeological record, remains of about a dozen or so pagan religious sanctuaries, and many of those in and of themselves combined Semitic or Arabic gods with Greco-Roman divinities. There is also a building that was made into a synagogue which is a very large and elaborate building, reflecting um, what must have been a very substantial Jewish community at the site, and another building, much smaller, that was converted into a meeting place for Christians. And this is, in fact, the earliest known, securely dated church.
in the world at this point, house church. Um, because of the division of fines from the excavations between the two participants, Yale and the French Academy, we at the gallery have um, wall paintings from the house church, as well as from one of the most interesting of the pagan sanctuaries, the Shrine of Mithras. And from the synagogue, the wall paintings, as part of the French um, partage or share, stayed in Damascus, so they are still in the National Museum of Syria in Damascus. But we have at the gallery painted terracotta tiles that decorated the ceiling of the assembly room. There were originally um, about 400 of those. 200 and or so were discovered in the excavations. Um, so those tiles were divided between Damascus and New Haven. So you can see some of those tiles behind me here. Um, as I said, they are square, square-ish <laughs> terracotta tiles painted with an assortment of imagery, um, floral and fruit images, some female faces, what seem to be zodiac signs in many cases. Um, a few of the tiles have inscriptions, Greek and Aramaic, reflecting the dedication of the assembly room in the 240s. So the house church at Dura Europas, or what has come to be known as the Christian building, as the excavators labeled it, was um, a regular house that in the 240s was renovated and converted on the inside for meetings of the Christian community. In contrast to the synagogue, this was a modest structure um, and suggests that the Christian community at Dura at the time was quite small. We don't have any indication as to whether they were meeting in secret or whether um, it was a known part of the population of the city, um, but it was certainly coexisting with all of the pagan relig religious sanctuaries and the synagogue. They were all active within blocks of each other at the same point in time, right up until the fall of the city in 256. The, build, the room that is most um, interesting archaeologically and that we have the most preserved from was made into a baptistry, where members of the community were baptized into the Christian faith. These wall paintings are all from that room, uh, and they represent images of salvation and miracles of Christ that the uh, initiates coming to be baptized would have seen and learned from uh, as they joined the community through the rite of baptism. The different images include a procession of women coming to this white structure that has been variously interpreted over the years as the tomb of Christ or as a tent. Um, above that are images, again, miracles of Christ. So here, the um, healing of the paralytic in a representation that shows Christ in the background Below him, to the right, the paralyzed man lying on his bed. And then to the left, you see the man healed, rising up and walking off with the bed sort of strapped to his back. Um, and beside it, the scene of uh, walking on water, and you see um, Christ and Peter in the foreground, in the waves, and behind them, the other apostles on a ship. This procession, so the initiates would have come this way with the procession and the miracle scenes to their right as they walked toward the apse where the baptismal font was located. And above that would have been this image of Christ as the Good Shepherd. So you see him with this huge ram over his shoulders and the rest of the flock to the side. Um, on the bottom, this small vignette, 
possibly added slightly later, represents Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. On the opposite side of the room, the opposite wall from this group of images um, are a few other images, including this one, less well-preserved and more fragmentary. Um, but you see a woman leaning over, reaching with a rope or, or a piece of cloth into this circular structure, probably a well, and interpreted as such by the excavators, who identified the woman as um, the Samaritan woman at the well. That has been disputed over the years. Um, and another possibility is, it, is that it represents Mary in an Annunciation scene um, where she is sometimes shown outside at a well. Interpretation of some of these scenes that are less obvious than others is made problematic by the fact that this is such an early example of Christian religious art and architecture. We don't have very much comparanda from this time period, the mid third century. Most of comparanda that can be found and identified and used to try to understand this comes from centuries later. Um, it's possible also that the image is shown, you know, whereas scholars will often try to match the images up with the text and the canon that is familiar to us, but that canon may date from a later period as well. And what we, might, what we may be looking at is a phase of Christianity and early Christian art that is, is just simply different from what we've come to expect. But it's an extremely important group of objects um, obviously, for understanding the history of art, Christian art, and the connection between art and ritual in the study of Christianity. So these paintings have a very long and somewhat tragic conservation history. Even upon the moment of their discovery, they were in worse um, a worse state of preservation than many of the other wall paintings from Dura. And the excavators recognized this. They also recognized their importance archaeologically and for the history of art and the history of religion. So when the wall paintings were lifted from their context, brought back to New Haven, they were immediately studied and treated by conservators who at the time were at the top of their field. Geddes and Stout, um, who were from Harvard University and are really considered the fathers of modern conservation, looked at the wall paintings and treated them. The primary problem was the salts that were inherently in the soil around the wall paintings and the plaster of the walls as they moved or as the climate uh, conditions shifted, these salts migrated outward, um, taking with them pigment and, and making the painted surface of the walls flake. In an effort to stop that flaking, Geddes and Stout chose to consolidate the surface with a material that was, again, sort of state of the art for the time. It was polyvinyl acetate, PVA, and it is a material that we now know really did more harm than good. Uh, it's not something that conservation science would use today. But what they were doing was trying to stabilize the surface, keep the paint from flaking. So over the years, 30s, 40s, 50s, as more and more of the surface was lost, they fought against that by coating it again and again with layer after layer of PVA. So over the years, the PVA on the surface darkened to such an extent that it was decided to try a rather drastic conservation treatment to save the paintings. The um, art gallery commissioned a conservator to try a strapo or transfer technique. This is a technique that had been used successfully to save frescoes in Florence from flooded areas of the city. 
Um, the idea was that the painted surface could be transferred off of the salt-laden plaster from the ancient walls and then transferred onto a new, more stable backing material. And in this case, um, the conservator decided to use a panel of fiberglass to which the wall painting surface would be adhered using epoxy. Um, we know from the conservation records that this process didn't go entirely smoothly and that some of the ancient painted surface was actually lost in the transfer process. When in 2009 to 12, that time frame, we started looking at these wall painting fragments for installation in this gallery, the decision was made to use the excavation photographs that are in the gallery's archives so that we knew what the, photo, what the wall paintings looked like upon discovery and use those as documentation for our objects conservator to actually, after removing as much as possible of the PVA, restore some of the painted details that could be seen in the excavation photographs not to make them look brand new um, and completely restored, but to make them exhibitable to the degree that people could visit and understand these extremely important works of early Christian art. So what we have here is the Dura Mithraeum. This is one of the many pagan religious sanctuaries that was at the site. Uh, and you can see how well preserved it is and that we have an incredible assortment of wall paintings as well as cult relief sculptures from the shrine. The Dura Mithraeum, the shrine to the god Mithras, was situated in the part of the city that was the Roman military camp. Um, it was a shrine founded by Palmyrenes serving in the Roman army stationed at Dura. Uh, and probably predominantly um, served worshippers who were part of the military. Mithras is a god that was worshipped throughout the Roman Empire. He was particularly popular with soldiers and also merchants. Um, but we find these shrines to Mithras all around the empire. Anywhere the Roman army was, um, there is often evidence for worship of Mithras. The cult was a mystery religion, so it was uh, initiation based and it seems to have been probably open only to men and the stages, there were seven stages of initiation into the cult and once worshippers were initiated they were sworn to secrecy, so they did not speak of the rituals or the tenets of the cult to those who were not members. As a result, we know even today very little about what went on in the shrines, uh, what the beliefs and rituals consisted of. So shrines to Mithras found all around the Roman Empire uh, have certain elements that are consistent in the iconography. There are also certain individualizations in different parts of the Roman world, and there are certainly, certainly elements of the Dura Mithraeum that are unusual or even unique. So the center point of the cult is always the image of Mithras slaying a bull, the Tarachtini. Um, in this case, we have two limestone reliefs showing that scene. You see Mithras here with his plunging a knife into the neck of the bull. You can see how much ancient pigment is preserved. Um, we know from photographs upon discovery and a reconstruction painting that was done in the field by Herbert Goot that the figure of Mithras was actually gilded and the entire scene very brightly painted with um, a variety of colors. In this case, the Tarachtini scene is accompanied by this group who represent the donors to the shrine. That's an unusual element for Mithraic cult reliefs, but 
it is quite typical in cult reliefs of other pagan religious sanctuaries to have uh, donor images. On the side walls are scenes of a figure, either Mithras or potentially one or two of his companions hunting um, with bow and arrow. And that appears to be an element that is distinctive to Dura and reflects the fact that the group of soldiers who commissioned the shrine were archers, Palmyrene archers serving in the Roman army. Other elements such as images from the life of Mithras and zodiac signs, zodiac signs are here as well, are ubiquitous in Mithraea all around the Roman Empire. Um, this shrine had another Tarachtony originally painted at the top of the arch. There are torches and flaming altars. Uh, and then on either side here, these figures who have not quite been identified, and there's been a lot written about who they may be, um, but they as appear to be members of the cult, priests, or, or someone high up in the administration of the shrine. Because Dura was a Roman military garrison, we have in our collection a number of arms and armor um, from the Romans who were occupying the city. Arguably one of the most spectacular pieces is this complete set of scale horse armor. The excavators found two of these objects. One is in Damascus, one is here at Yale. The one in Damascus has bronze scales. Ours has iron scales. The scales are attached to a linen blanket underneath um, and edged with leather, as you can see, and rawhide. The cavalry rider would have also been covered in scale armor, and we have bits and pieces of human-sized scales, as well as more of the larger scales, which probably come from at least a third example of this kind of armor. One of the interesting things that this object tells us has to do with the interaction of cultures that always constantly was taking place at Dura, um, and in this case, in the military realm. So the Romans, the Roman army, at this time, when they got to the Near East, they didn't really have this sort of heavily armored cavalry as part of their troops, the, the makeup of their troops. But the Sasanians, who they started fighting against, did, um, and were known for it. And so the Romans, being above all very skilled military tacticians, recognized that in order to compete in this world, they needed to adopt a similar kind of defensive armor. And so this is an example of Roman horse armor that we have from Dura, um, but it uses um, something that the Sasanians had developed previously. So as I stated earlier, this gallery was installed for Dura Europa's in 2012, and it remained essentially unchanged for about six years. The emphasis of that installation was on the archaeological and historical context of the objects. And in about 2017, 18, and 19, we decided that it would be interesting to present the objects in a new way, with a new perspective on the sculpture in particular, the wall paintings, the monumental works of art from the city, and their connections with other parts of the Roman Empire, in particular Palmyra, which had such a strong and important influence on the city. Um, we are in the final phases of this reinstallation of the material, um, and I welcome you all to come to New Haven, come to the Art Gallery, and see it for yourself.